It's hard to look back at your past, see it with the benefit of hindsight, and not want to fix some of your old mistakes. We've been making movie lists for almost five years now, and we're still figuring out how to get it right. So we're calling a do-over, taking a mulligan, and winding the clock back to some of the lists we'd like to try once more. And first up are our updated picks for the 10 best long takes of all time. Back in early 2014, we opened our long take list jumping straight into the excellent restaurant fight from The Protector. We hadn't yet figured out categories or honorable mentions, so we skipped all the foreplay and went straight into the business. That shot still holds up to this day, but with a second chance, we'd combine it with our later pick, Hard Boiled, and drill down into the best action sequence long takes that there are. And there are some great oldies we missed. The hilarious opening send up from JCVD, the incredible POV insanity from Strange Days, and the magnificent swooping shootout from Breaking News. But even more than that, the past four years have been especially kind to long take action on TV in Game of Thrones, True Detective, and Daredevil, and on the silver screen. Fight sequences like those in The Raid, Kingsman, and The Revenant are all astonishing and worth a watch, but we think the only recent shootout good enough to take down Hard Boiled would be this one from Atomic Blonde. Bested only by the only hand-to-hand -hand long take good enough to take down the protector, and our new first pick, this one from Creed. Don't get us wrong, that protector shot is a far more significant feat in terms of technical accomplishment. But what we think this shot in Creed really succeeds at is putting you right in the middle of the experience of a boxing match. It comes at you fast with no pause for breath or consideration. The violence is happening right now and in your face, and it doesn't let up. And the way the camera is choreographed with the boxers is absolutely astonishing. It elevates Scorsese's work in Raging Bull to its next logical level, and significantly updates the cut heaviness of the original Rocky, where one round blends into the next in a never-ending montage, and that's part of the reason we like the Atomic Blonde shot, too. As these shots wear on, you begin to feel the strain of endurance. You begin to wonder how long they can really keep this up. You feel the length of time accumulating behind you, and you realize it all must be so incredibly taxing. The formalism of the camera, the way the telling informs what's being told, vastly expands our viewership experience, which you must know by now is always a pick in our book. Our next pick, all those years ago, marked our first encounter with the cinematic genius who was Andrei Tarkovsky. We picked this shot from the mirror, and I distinctly recall that we saw it knowing absolutely nothing about it going in. And it blew our goddamn minds. We were so entranced by it that we wanted to put it first on our list, but we got talked out of it due to its relative obscurity. Fortunately for us, it was the beginning of our introduction to slow cinema, and since then we've learned that much of our audience is as crazy about it as we are. Today, we could probably look at this shot of the mirror alongside others from Tarkovsky, the candle scene from Nostalgia, the ending of Stalker, in concert with some of the best from his peers. Like this beautiful off-screen death in the penultimate shot of Antonioni's The Passenger, or this perfect farewell in the last shot of Mizuguchi's Ugetsu. This opening of Miklos Jansko's The Red and the White, or this era-spanning sequence shot from Angelopolis is The Hunters. But for this pick four years on, we're still sticking with the mirror. Honestly, even today, the only thing we'd change would be moving it to its rightful place on this list at number one. It really is our favorite. Next, we gave a slot to the Dunkirk beach scene from Atonement, and we don't feel bad about it at all. It's damn good. But because we've already seen it and we've got a second chance here to find something new, we might crack open a category for incredibly freaking massive endeavors that involve some absolutely insane staging to pull off. And in that category, you probably find the ending of The Sacrifice, burning an entire house down twice, and the assault scene from The Longest Day that involves an actual town-sized battle, the Civil War aftermath from Gone with the Wind, and the climax from Angamali Diaries, which puts you in the middle of an 11 minute ride of a festival and took over 1,000 people to pull off. But for our Redux pick here, we think the best scene to supplant atonement would have to be this one from the funeral sequence in Soy Cuba. Soy Cuba's beautiful wade through a city in mourning seems like a relatively attainable level of pre Steadicam long take awesomeness before this happens, and the camera heads up and up and up some more. 
soaring over the streets of Havana like an ascending soul. Accomplished with some rudimentary combination of camera vests, hooks, and a cable to hoist it all sky high, this shot seems to set its scope at no less than the entirety of Cuba. And it's not the only jaw-dropping accomplishment in the film either. An earlier, equally improbable shot descends a multi-story party down poolside and then continues underwater. But we prefer the ascent, with all its technical virtuosity secondary to the limitless expanse of its attempts to create the sense of an entire country in mourning. Our fourth pick last go around was the traffic jam shot from Godard's Weekend. And while we love Godard and cannot overstate his influence, with a little more experience and a lot more research under our belts, we actually think this shot holds up pretty poorly. It's just really alienating, deliberately so, and it lacks the delight of some of the better oneers we've seen since. You know who isn't alienating and whose every shot is delightful and who also just happened to work in France? Max Ophuls. When it comes to long takes, we would gladly replace Godard with Ophuls. The only tough question is which one? Maybe this delightful introduction to the bordello in Le Placier, or this swooping, spinning, dancing doozy from earlier in that same film. You can sense the magic of his camera movement, even in the simplicity of this opening from the earrings of Madame De. And we're confident any of them could land on this list and not get knocked off for decades to come. But if we're going to commit to one, it's got to be the crowd pleaser. This one from La Ronde. Even when it is moving simply, there is music in the camera of Max Ophuls. There is an inescapable sense of poetry in his every turn. Other long takes are glorious, impressive. They can even soar, and we would probably laugh at anyone else for saying this if we hadn't actually seen this shot. But here, the movement of the camera itself is almost sensuous, and this isn't entirely an observation in a void. In his own time, Max was frequently disqualified from serious filmmaker contention because of his propensity to make women's films with a feminine. Feminine touch. Well, if this is a feminine touch, we want more. Because as much as we like battles, shootouts, and showy one-upsmanship, this shot is just magic. La fille et le soldat. We followed Weekend with a one-two punch of opening shots. First, this one from the player, and then this one from Touch of Evil. And on second thought, we think they ought to duke it out between themselves and a few other brilliant openers that similarly introduce the action to come. Consider Boogie Nights, or Baby Driver, or La La Land, and maybe they're not first first, but they're close enough for government work early on in films like Serenity, and oh god, especially Twelve Angry Men, introducing every single character in one perfect move that you hardly even notice is taking you around the whole room. Maybe it follows, or Halloween, or Bonfire of the Vanities. No, having weighed all the options properly this time, we feel good about giving it to Touch of Evil. That one is a classic for a reason, and we think we did it justice on our own list. We next picked a pretty great tracking shot from Boogie Nights that follows Little Bill through a party, building its way up to a murder. On second look, it seems like it's cut from a pretty similar cloth as this later pick of ours from Snake Eyes, in that it asks a dramatic question, follows a narrative arc, and then moves us forward until its dramatic resolution. Today, we call this category the "scene in a bottle," and we think it can do better than Boogie Nights, and way better than Snake Eyes, which is the only pick we're truly embarrassed about. First, Boogie Nights would lead us to look at a really similar shot just last year from Three Billboards that sees Sam Rockwell throw a guy out a window, and from there we might compare Snake Eyes to the vastly superior opening shot. From the secret in their eyes, that starts out in a helicopter above a stadium and then lands in its crowd before going on to over five more minutes of action. Minority Report and Kill Bill both track overhead in order to keep us fully informed about a conflict in its geography. And if we're out and we could show it to you, we would be very tempted to go with the absolutely devastating hospital sequence from Roma that may well be Quaron's best shot ever directed. However, instead, we're going with a different hospital sequence that is more than worthy of our slot. This time. From Bellatar's Workmeister Harmonies. In a film whose average shot is over three minutes long, this one, perhaps the most remarkable of them all, finds an unnamed Hungarian town whipped into a frenzy by an ominous circus act that doesn't perform. Its rioters unleashing their directionless anger on anyone and everyone. Clawing into a hospital and ripping it and its patients to pieces, and there's so much working in this shot. Its steady, impassive gaze seems at once unconcerned with the pace of its rabid subjects, satisfied to tarry behind, glide ahead, or shift its attention entirely, and simultaneously devastated by it. Responding to this anger not with fury or outrage in response, but a great remorse at the senselessness of it all. But there's also something slowly relentless about it, as if the camera were a wise, all-knowing eye stuck in time, but sure of where it would end up. 
pushing forward unceasingly as if it had a final tragic destination. And we can sense that we're not just heading nowhere, but that we will inevitably arrive. And when we reach that destination and see the futility of this destructive force rendered impotent in an instant, the camera finally halts, and so do they, and so do we. Next, we turn to Goodfellas for its Copacabana tour, and we gotta be straight up with you, we're not replacing this shot. It's simply the best of its kind, but we will consider those that come close, that kind being steady cam masterpieces that take us into the belly of a new world. Maybe David Bowie's hyperactive London intro from Absolute Beginners, or Ryan Gosling's build up to the globe of death from Place Beyond the Pines. There's Shaun of the Dead's two parallel tours of his neighborhood corner store, and Frenzy's long walk to the murderer's flat, followed by its brilliant camera only only retreat. They're all great, but they're no good fellas. Finishing off our review of the last incarnation of this list, we had two shots from Alfonso Cuaron, the opening of Gravity, and his car shot from Children of Men. Now, many of our commenters decried the inclusion of Gravity because of its heavy use of CGI, while others decried our Children of Men pick because it wasn't the battle scene shot. Now, we understand the first complaint. We loved the Gravity long take because of the experience it created for us. But part of the fun of a long take is thinking about how utterly improbable the shot was to actually pull off. And Gravity just doesn't tick that box. But if we're talking camera complexity, we don't think it gets much crazier than the Children of Men car shot. Other contenders in a category about it might include the contact mirror shot. The Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde POV take was pretty impressive for its day. And who's to forget some of the longer stretches from Enter the Void? But even with one digital stitch in the middle of it, either half of the car sequence from Children of Men leaves you wondering how the hell they pulled it off. So we're keeping it. Of course, with all those categories combined and quite a few of our old picks eliminated, we're left with two more slots to get us to 10, which is great because we think there are a few niches we didn't look at last time around. And the first avenue we'd expand our search down would be that of the static long take, the long take that's almost the exact opposite of Children of Men's car scene. The camera isn't doing anything impressive, it's hardly doing anything at all. It's sitting there and maybe panning if we're lucky. The result is a simpler, quieter effect, but an effect nonetheless, as seen and heard in the gentle conversation behind us as we stare out the window from syndromes in a century, and at the dinner table from four months, three weeks, two days. The final duel from Sanjuro reveals its stillness for an uncomfortably long amount of time before finally erupting in violence. The Before trilogy is filled with simple, static wonders that ease us into a world of gentle conversation, while Hunger crackles with a sharp bite of 17 and a half minutes of whip-sharp dialogue. However, for our pick in this new category, we adore the opening scene from Flowers of Shanghai. Shin has staged a wonderfully alive moment here, and to be set in front of it and offered an opportunity to witness it even uncomplicatedly and plainly is a treat. But by gently working the camera back and forth across this particular scene, he manages to add just a little extra to the telling. The in particular casual way in which the scene is shot conveys an unmistakable fondness for its subjects. There's no real hurry, no real aim, no real shape or structure. The camera appears to find each person at the table as fascinating as the next, each speaker as interesting as his listener, each participant as telling as its bystander. All of them just the tips of their own personal iceberg of unimaginable depth. This shot is so entranced by the reverie of life's little detail that it has resolved itself not to focus on any one particular place, but to just enjoy itself taking it all in, and the way it moves invites us to wonder along with it. Last but certainly not least, the last five years have seen an explosion in those films that are undertaken top to bottom in one single take. Where previously our options were pretty much just Rope, Russian Ark, and PVC-1, all awesome examples with their own flaws, there are tons more to choose from today. Utoya 22 July is a harrowing real-time portrayal of an attack on a summer camp. While King Dave is a wildly fresh approach that inexplicably combines a one -er with a non-linear storytelling structure, and if you love the longest of long takes, A Boy, A Girl, A Dream, Lost in London, and A Shadow Behind the Moon are all worth a watch too. We obviously can't forget Birdman, the Oscar-winning film made to appear as a single one -er, and it's freaking awesome, but if Quaron loses points for digital trickery, so does Inyaritsu. We're holding this spot for the real thing, Victoria. That's right, Victoria is the real deal. An entire film from tip to toe shot in one take. The pacing isn't perfect, and the conceit certainly has its ups and downs, but it's the best effort yet at one take cinema. 
In its 140-minute run, the film zigzags across most of Berlin, takes its tone through a number of paces, and elicits performances with a kind of genuine continuity that can usually only be found in the theater. But it's not theater, it's cinema at its boldest. This long, elaborate piece of camera work, a performance in and of itself, unfurling as a wonderfully varied piece of kinetic calligraphy, the making of the project was as bold and reckless and naive as its characters, but it paid off, which is why it's our new pick for one of the best long takes of all time. Well, technically number two, because remember we moved the mirror up? But you know what? It doesn't matter. The order literally doesn't matter anymore, if it ever did. I don't know. So, what do you think? Did we get it wrong again? Did we leave out more great long takes? I'm sure we did. There are tons. Tell us which ones and maybe we'll finally nail it in 2023. And until then, be sure to subscribe for more Cinefix Movie Lists.